uma boa noite a todos e a todas. Sejam todos bem-vindos. Nós estamos começando a nossa próxima atividade e hoje a gente está recebendo uma pessoa muito especial, que é a professora Jill Tarter. Ela foi fundadora do programa SET e vai estar falando um pouco sobre a perspectiva cósmica da busca por vida fora da Terra. E junto conosco também está a minha aluna Franciele, a Glaucia, que é a professora de inglês, que vai fazer toda a parte da tradução, e a professora Jill Tarter, will start when she won. <laughs> so, thank you for coming, Professor Jill Tarter, and do the presentation. Well, Bruno, thank you for asking me to, to present. Um, I usually introduce myself um, kind of like this. Uh, I'm, I work with teams who use radio telescopes to try and find evidence of extraterrestrial technology. Uh, I'm the one that is not wearing the headphones. So I have degrees in engineering physics and astrophysics, and all of my jobs from the very beginning have revolved around trying to find evidence of someone else's technology. And although I am officially retired, I still continue to try and cheerlead for everything associated with SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So um, before we start talking about finding them, I'd like to help put us in context. So where are we and when are we? And I hope by the time this lecture is over, you may have a, a different perspective on who you are and where you are. So, um, Well, obviously, where are we? We're here, which for me and for many of you, I assume, has been um, staying in our rooms or our homes and working remotely for now 18 months. And in my case, um, that home is here in the uh, hills of Berkeley, California, in the San Francisco Bay Area and from the altitude of a low earth orbiting satellite, uh, we'd all be able to understand that my here is on the west coast of the United States. And since 1968, when astronaut Bill Anders took this Christmas Eve photo of Earthrise, we've been able to envision ourselves as being here. This is our first opportunity for a truly cosmic perspective. Um, and it changed how we see ourselves and became an emblem for the environmental movement. This planet hanging in the darkness and blackness of space. And um, in the summer of 2013, the Cassini spacecraft, which was orbiting Saturn, turned around and looked back and took a selfie of all of us here. So at the end of that arrow, there is a little tiny white dot, and that's us, that's all of us. Um, and earlier, before that in 1990, when the Voyager 1 spacecraft passed by Neptune, it also turned around to image us as a pale blue dot in a streak of sunlight and dust. So we're here. And our sun and the planets that orbit it, um, our sun is one of about 400 billion stars in what we call the Milky Way galaxy. And until now, I've shown you actual pictures of the things that I'm talking about. But this is not a picture of our Milky Way because we can't get outside to look back and take that picture. It's actually a picture of another large spiral galaxy called M101. And we think, and we have long thought, that 
this is what the Milky Way would look like if we could get outside and look back. Well, we can't get outside and we can't take an image of the Milky Way at uh, visible wavelengths from the inside. But indeed, if you use radio waves, you in fact can actually map out the structure of the Milky Way from the inside out. And after something like 5,000 hours of telescope time, uh, this recently published map of the Milky Way is our best uh, representation of what our galaxy actually looks like. And you can see it's pretty close to what we had thought. So um, this is the Milky Way galaxy. Our sun is one of about 400,000 stars in that galaxy. And in this picture from the Hubble Deep Field, you can see our galaxy is one of several hundred billion galaxies in the observable universe. So these dots in this beautiful image from Hubble are not stars. They are actually individual galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each one of them. And you can see that some of them are smaller and fainter than others. And that's because they're farther away. And that reminds us that as we look farther out into space, we are also looking farther back in time. So when are we? Well, we're now. And to the best of our understanding, that's about 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang formation of our universe. And you can see in this artist's representation that the nature of the matter and energy in that universe changed over time. It was originally very, very hot and dense and as the universe has expanded, that matter has, has cooled down until we have, at the current epoch, stars and galaxies. And, you know, we're, th this is like a um, scientific creation myth, if you wish. And it's really a pretty good story, but we're not yet completely comfortable with it. Um, because at the very earliest times and the very densest uh, phases of the universe, we really can't make gravity and quantum mechanics play nice together yet. So there is some cosmology and some physics that we have yet to figure out. And indeed, this story is based on observing only about 4% of the total matter energy density of the observable universe. And the unobserved parts we call dark matter, dark energy, because we don't know what they are, what that other 96% is. But nevertheless, um, this is yet the most self-consistent perspective on here and now that's ever been assembled. And we expect, as we learn more, that this will change going forward, but probably not by a lot, right? And that's the nature of science. It allows for self-correction and improvement. So what do humans have to do with this picture? Well, we're actually um, very intimately connected with long ago times and far away places. So we humans trace our lineage, not just back through the centuries of our families and not just back through the millennia of history with its art and experiments in governance. 
We trace our heritage not just back over the millions of years since we branched off from the great apes, not just back through the 2.4 billion years during which Earth's atmosphere has been perfused with oxygen thanks to the photosynthetic labors of cyanobacteria, and not just back to the formation of the sun in our solar system some 4.6 billion years ago. But back beyond that, another few million years to a giant molecular cloud that was contaminated by the winds of Wolf Rayet stars and the debris of supernova explosions and the radionucleotides from neutron star collisions. So here's a picture of a modern supernova. So back billions of years ago, in this giant molecular cloud, all of the things beyond hydrogen and helium, all of the elements, all of the stuff that makes you, you, right? Um, were incorporated as debris in this large molecular cloud. So the iron atoms in the hemoglobin molecules of your blood and the calcium in your bones and teeth, these elements were all fused, literally cooked up, deep within old massive stars that ended their lives in catastrophic explosions. We call them supernovae, like this one. And that blast, these explosions blasted off the outer layers of the star, um, leaving behind remnants and the building blocks of everything that would come in the future. And so these remnants of a modern supernova will be incorporated into a future generation of stars and planets and perhaps life. So what we've learned over the hundreds of years of scientific exploration is that it truly takes a cosmos to make a human. You and I and all of us are literally made of stardust. So we study this um, field uh, under uh, a title called astrobiology. We're trying to find inhabited worlds through the actions of the inhabitants of those worlds. And it has, under that astrobiology umbrella, there are two different um, specialties. One is called searching for biosignatures and the other searching for technosignatures. So when we're looking for life beyond Earth, there are a number of ways that we might find it. We could discover it. We could find in situ biomarkers um, or artifacts in the solar system by sending probes and scientific equipment and eventually humans to various bodies in our solar system or we could look for remote biosignatures that uh, are part of exoplanets, planets that orbit um, distant stars. So what would we be looking for? Well, when we think about the Earth and the life on it, and we compare it to the other planets in our solar system, we find that the chemistry in Earth's atmosphere is very different than all the atmospheres of other planets. It's in chemical disequilibrium. That means that at the same time in our atmosphere, we find molecular oxygen and methane gas. And those are two very reactive gases and if you put them together in the laboratory, they're going to turn into carbon dioxide and water. And that's happening in our atmosphere all the time, yet we still see 
abundant oxygen and methane gas. And that's because there's a biosphere on the surface of our planet that is continually producing oxygen with photosynthesis from plants and producing methane from bovine flatulin from cow fart. So although in the atmosphere, we're constantly changing oxygen and methane to carbon dioxide and water, those molecules are being replaced by the biosphere on the surface of our planet. And so this disequilibrium chemistry is a pretty clear marker of the fact that there's life on Earth. And we hope in time to be able to have instrumentation that could show us the atmospheres of distant exoplanets. But you know, it's gonna be a really hard job and it may not be completely clear cut. The results of these kinds of observations may be ambiguous. And here's a good example. So recently in this past year, there's been a claim that in the cloud layers of Venus, scientists had observed the molecule phosphine, right? And at least on Earth, wherever phosphine is produced, it requires a biological component. That is, we can't just make this in, out of laboratory chemicals. We need biology to produce phosphine on Earth. And so it made scientists wonder whether this might in fact be evidence for biology, for life um, in the cloud layers of Venus. Now, it was a difficult detection. Spectroscopically, the astronomers who made this claim um, identified the feature in the spectrum from Venus as phosphine on the basis of a single line. And usually we don't like to do that. We want many different lines in the spectrum. Uh, these molecular, these fingerprints, spectral fingerprints of different molecules. But there was only a single line that looked like it was at exactly the right frequency to be coming from a phosphine molecules. But there was also an awful lot of it. Really, really hard to explain how much, well, subsequently the estimates of how much phosphine was there were um, diminished, but still it was, a, in, it was an ambiguous story. And as additional work went on, uh, in fact, the conclusion was that no, in f it was not phosphine that had been detected, but rather um, <clears throat> sulfur dioxide. So, but, so, so that ambiguity was huge, even though Venus is right next door. When we try and do similar sorts of things for exoplanets that are orbiting diff distant stars, there is likely to be ambiguity in um, the determination of biosignatures. That ambiguity could be reduced, perhaps, if we decided to look for mathematicians rather than microbes, if we decided to look for technosignatures. Um, here's another example of uh, things that we're wondering about in our own solar system. When we look at Enceladus, a icy moon of Saturn, we see that near the South Pole, there are these plumes, these vents from cryovolcanoes that are escaping the uh, surface of the planet. And we know that underneath all that ice is a salty liquid ocean. And at the bottom of the Earth's ocean, we find these hydrothermal vents, these places where the crust is splitting open and really superheated water and gas is bursting through. 
And we wonder if these plumes that we see on this icy moon might in fact be driven by the equivalent of hydrothermal vents um, at the bottom of the ocean on Enceladus and also Europa, a moon of Jupiter. So we are now planning missions for the future that spacecraft will actually fly through these plumes, sample them, and using a mass spectrometer and other instrumentation, try and figure out what the molecules in these plumes are. And perhaps we will determine that the molecules are biological molecules or fragments of biological molecules. And this might, in fact, uh, allow us to uh, conclude that perhaps there is something equivalent to hydrothermal vents and all of the life around them um, at the bottom of this um, icy moon's oceans, just like at the bottom of Earth's oceans. So again, it may be totally ambiguous. It might not be a smoking gun, right? We might still be uh, have uh, some reservations about what we actually find. So for me, I really would like to look for mathematicians and their technologies rather than microbes. So that means that there's a second thing a second way we can look for life beyond Earth, we can perhaps detect its work product. We can look for techno signatures, evidence of someone else's technology, or just by observing the cosmos in different ways, we might find uh, serendipitously um, observations that indicate some sort of vast astro engineering projects. Again, that might be ambiguous. There might be natural causes for, for what's observed, but uh, it also might tell us that we're looking at someone else's technology. And on Earth, we've been looking for techno signatures for about 60 years now. We've been looking for radio signals and optical signals that might indicate um, the presence of some sort of technology on a distant world. And in that search, that search for techno signatures, there are two kinds of deliberate signals that we've been looking for. We've been looking for signals that are almost natural, and we've been looking for signals that are obviously engineered. In the case of almost natural signals, right? Um, we're thinking about something like, here's a pulsar, right? And it has a particular period, right? Now, what if it switched its period? We've seen pulsars that do that because of a star quake, but we've never seen a pulsar that switched from one period to a second period and then back to the original period. If we did, we might really be suspicious that this was technological, right? So we would capture these pulsars in our searches for natural pulsars, but then some graduate student or postdoc peering through the data would say, huh, this is really strange. And we might serendipitously have detected uh, someone else's technology. Another example is looking for transits. That's how we detect most of the exoplanets that we now know about. But planets are spherical, and therefore the shadow that they cast when they pass in front of their star is circular. And if you take high time resolution images of these transit events, at the beginning of the transit and the end of the transit, at ingress and egress, the higher order moments of that light curve could indicate the difference between a circular shadow 
and something that was a triangle or a Venetian blind, something that was an artificial transit, something built and put in orbit in order to give these intriguing light curves. Here's another example. Cepheid variables are a type of star that expand and get brighter and then collapse and get dimmer and then do it all over again with a very regular period. But if you're in advanced technology and you can orbit some sort of um, energy factory around that star, then you can arrange so that as the star expands and then contracts and it's thinking about expanding again, you can zap it with neutrinos or some other form of energy and cause it to expand prematurely. So now what you've done is developed a Morse code that can be seen all the way to the nearest cluster of, of galaxies. Really bright. So you have a, a, a normal period and you have a short period. So you have a dash and a dot and you can modify this um, Cepheid to encode information that can be seen all the way across the galaxy. So those are some things that are almost natural, right? Obviously, signals, that's what we've been looking for for decades. We're looking in the radio portion of the spectrum for frequency compression, a signal that's only on a single dial, a single channel of the radio dial, right? Very, very narrow band. And in the optical, we've been looking for time compression, right? Very, very short, bright optical pulses that we don't think nature can produce. And more recently, we've been looking for laser signals. We've been looking for light that's monochromatic at a single frequency. Nature doesn't do this, but technologies do. And the reason for distinguishing between these different kinds of signals is that um, there are observational consequences. For the almost natural signals, we are going to build, for the purpose of astronomy, we're going to build instruments that look at the universe in all kinds of different ways. And they may stumble across something that's almost natural. But for these obviously engineered signals, astronomers aren't going to build these the tools to find these because they're not natural. So we have to build our own tools and we have to build dedicated telescopes to detect such signals. So over the years, um, since SETI first got started in NASA in 1975, um, there have been a number of activities, starting with workshops to see what we should do, uh, out of those workshops came ideas about how to find exoplanets because at the time we had no idea whether other stars had had any planets at all. So all of the exoplanet research came out of these early workshops on SETI. Um, uh, we have had financial problems. Senator Proxmire gave SETI a Golden Fleece Award. We, we figured out how to do a 10-year um, systematic search uh, as a NASA project using world's large radio telescopes and NASA's deep space network telescopes. Um, after the launch of that, Senator Proxmire in the US Senate terminated the program a year later. And then the SETI Institute uh, with philanthropic private funding uh, began a project what we called Phoenix rising from the ashes of congressional termination, which did most of which, um, most of the observing that the NASA high resolution microwave survey had planned to do. So along the way, uh, at the turn of the century, in 1998, 1999, we had a series of workshops again, because that's the way you do things. And we put out a big report about what we should do for the next couple of decades. And we decided that uh, although we had been doing radio searches up until then, we should start to do searches in the optical and the infrared, which we have done. 
we d decided that instead of just getting 10 or 15 percent of the time on large astronomical instruments, we should build our own dedicated telescope so that we could observe 24 7 and that we should figure out a way to look at all the sky all the time so that we would have sensitivity to transient signals. Now the first two bullets we've done that. Um, the third one is what we're working on right now. And here's the dedicated telescope we built. It's called the Allen Telescope Array. It's in Northern California. It consists of 42 telescopes, each of which is six meters in diameter. We'd hoped to build 350 of these, but um, the technology development that we had to do to figure out how to build this was so extensive that we ran out of money after 42. So this interferometer actually observes 24 hours a day. It's designed for SETI and can do radio astronomy at the same time. It has unique, very, very wideband receivers that cover the entire uh, terrestrial microwave window. And it has, a, because the dishes are small, it has a very large field of view. It sees a lot of the sky at any one time. Let me just make that point again. And it was a deliberate choice to make small telescopes. So there's the Andromeda galaxy. And here's the moon at the same scale. So the moon is half a degree across. The Andromeda galaxy is two and a half degrees across. Right? It's a scale of things that we look at on the sky. If you use um, the Arecibo telescope, which we did until it destruct, self-destructed this past year, um, the field of view, the amount of sky that the Arecibo telescope could see, because it's a very large telescope, the field of view was very, very small. And so they built um, a focal plane array of multiple receivers to get more um, coverage of the sky at one time from Arecibo. But with a small six meter dish, right, that's the field of view, two and a half degrees across at um, the hydrogen 21 centimeter line. Right, and we built a radio camera. That is, we that field of view can be um, broken up into about 1,250 pixels for better spatial resolution, and each pixel has uh, 1,024 spectral channels or different colors. Right, so it's a very versatile instrument. It's a wide-angle radio camera. Um, that because there are so many baselines, that because there are so many telescopes, you can use it in a snapshot mode. You can just take an instantaneous image of the sky and get a good picture. And you can also, at the same time that you're observing the whole field of view of the telescope, you can also, with more instrumentation, phase up the information from the different telescopes to create individual small beams on the sky. And we had enough funding to build a beam former that could do three independent beams at the same time. And those beams, when you put them and point them at individual target stars, help us to um, avoid or to recognize interference from our own equipment or other satellites on the sky. So it's a very good system, very flexible. Um, and there's one more trick that you can do with an interferometer, which you can't do with a single dish. And that is you can predict the path of satellites or other things on the sky that you know are going to interfere with your observations. And you can manipulate the output from the individual telescopes before you combine it in order to make a null along the path of that interfering object. So again, this is, you can do active nulling, and this is a pitch for 
building large telescopes as interferometers in the future. And um, that is certainly what the astronomical community is now starting to do. All right, so we use this telescope for, um, for the first <clears throat> four years, uh, picking targets from a catalog that a graduate student and I put together called a HABCAT. And then um, uh, there were the first uh, results of detection of exoplanets that came from the Kepler spacecraft mission. And so we switched to picking stars that we knew had exoplanets as our targets. And finally, Kepler gave us so much data that when we did the statistics, we understood that in fact, every star has at least one planet. And therefore we could switch to observing as our targets, the stars that were closest to us and moving out. So you can see, this is a map of um, the uh, sky up until um, when that was printed out, which was, I guess, now it's a few years old. You can see where the Kep we, we focused on the Kepler field. And you can also see um, a range of uh, declinations that we never looked at. And that's because that's where the belt of geosynchronous satellites lie on the sky. And those are so loud in their transmissions that they would have um, completely obscured any signal that uh, might be being transmitted from a star in that direction. So we avoid the geosynchronous belt. And so this is what we've been doing at the SETI Institute, but more recently, um, the, the largest SETI programs that are being conducted are being done by Breakthrough Listen. Again, it's privately funded with a pledge from a billionaire, Yuri Milner, who has provided $100 million over 10 years for observing. And the uh, folks at UC Berkeley have been using that money to build spectacular back-end instrumentation, great spectrometers, and renting time on world, the world's largest telescopes. So they started at the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia in the US, and then they built instrumentation for the Parkes 64 meter telescope in Australia, uh, and the instrumentation for the uh, Automatic Planet Finder optical telescope at Lick Observatory in California. And they are now working on instrumentation for the very large telescope called FAST in China. It's like Arecibo was, only it's not 300 meters in diameter, it's 500 meters in diameter. And then um, in, <coughs> in, South, um, in, in um, South Africa, uh, there is a telescope, an array, called Meerkat, and they're building instrumentation for that. And Meerkat will grow, hopefully, over time to the square kilometer array, and we'll build more instrumentation for that. And finally, um, at uh, in, in England, in the United Kingdom, the Jodrell Bank Telescope um, is being instrumented for SETI by the Breakthrough Listen people. So more SETI today? Well, we were using Arecibo until it collapsed. So we don't have that anymore, but there's telescopes, low frequency telescopes um, across Europe and the United Kingdom called LOFAR that are being used. There's a SETI Italia group in Italy using a telescope at Medicina. Um, the Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope is um, an educational facility that's just outside the fence of the Deep Space Network. Uh, complex in Southern California, and students are using it to um, do a sky survey. And occasionally, um, a group in uh, Japan called Project Dorothy organizes campaigns where they get um, telescopes from all around the world with different frequencies to look at the same target simultaneously and see if there's any anomalies that correlate. Um, a project that I'm really excited about uh, is being done at the SETI Institute. Um, the principal investigator is Andrew Simeon, 
and he is taking um, the very large array of telescopes in Socorro, New Mexico. So 27 25 meter telescopes that are used to make exquisite radio images of the sky with very good spatial resolution. He has figured out a way to get the out, to make a copy of the outputs of the in, um, information from each of those telescopes and combine them together in the kind of spectrometer that we need to use to look for frequency compressed signals for SETI. So that's a project that's underway. It'll be, it's what we call commensal observing. So the telescope is being used for some primary uh, reason. Some astronomer has a research project that's using the telescope. But at the same time, we can take the data that's coming out of the telescope, which is looking somewhere on the sky at some frequency, and observe for these obviously engineered signals that we at SETI are interested in finding. Optical SETI has been done at Harvard, a uh, student project for a number of years. Uh, the data that come from the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, the data that are being taken to do radial velocity studies to find exoplanets, those data have all been reanalyzed to look for these um, transient flashes for, for SETI. There's um, actually an amateur SETI radio, um, I'm sorry, optical observatory in, um, in Panama at Boquete that does SETI observations. And it's also possible to look at archival data. In this case, the data that was um, collected by a spacecraft working in the infrared that did a survey of the entire sky and those data have been reanalyzed to look for um, techno signatures that could be coming from a, a type two or a type three uh, Kardashev civilization, which captures all of the energy from its star or its home galaxy. Um, and we are now working on new optical SETI projects. Um, there is an existing gamma ray facility uh, called Veritas uh, with four telescopes. And at the focal plane of each of those telescopes, there is um, a focal plane array that has about 500 pixels. And so we've written new software. So what the astronomers are looking for are big um, strikes across the focal plane array that come from air showers that come from high energy particles that are interacting with our atmosphere and leave these long trails. We've rewritten software that looks for single pixel events only. And we require that it's the same pixel on the sky from all four telescopes to have some confidence that we found a, an interesting optical transient that could be a techno signature. Um, Shelley Wright at UC San Diego in Southern California in the United States is using large plastic Fresnel lenses. You can see Shelley imaged behind one of those lenses and is building a dome where each of the segments of the dome have one of these Fresnel lenses. And the, the idea there is that the lens takes a big piece of the sky and focuses it on a very sensitive optical detector. And so um, with something like a dome with maybe 128 segments, uh, you could see 10,000 square degrees of the sky at any one time. So this is a way of looking at all the sky all the time, or most of the sky all the time. And then the last project, which is being done at the SETI Institute, is called laser SETI, and this is intended, in fact, ultimately to look at all the sky all the time. And Elliot Gillum is building these sets of cameras with gratings and very fast readout. And indeed, with eight cameras at a site, and the first one is operational in Northern California, the second site is becoming operational in Hawaii, 
it's a bit COVID delayed. Um, uh, and in, if indeed we can build with these inexpensive cameras, um, a dozen or 15 sites around the globe um, that work uh, with two sites working simultaneously looking at the same part of the sky, we can actually build an instrument that will look for optical transients uh, over all the sky all the time. So these are exciting new projects for us. And then of course the astronomy community is building wonderful new instrumentation that we need to figure out how to work with commensally. The James Webb Telescope, we hope, will launch finally this year. Um, then the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope uh, will fly perhaps with a star shield. And then depending on what our current decadal review of astronomy and astrophysics decides, we may fly in something called Habax or Louvoir. And these telescopes are beginning to be large enough to actually look for biosignatures. Ariel from, from, the, um, from ESA will also fly. And this is a funny looking telescope that's been proposed for Hawaii. It's kind of a uh, hybrid between an optical telescope and a radio telescope. But this could do one thing and one thing only, this Exo Life Finder. It could look at Proxima Centauri system, in particular Proxima B. And in fact, it could make an image, uh, an, in, uh, <coughs> uh, an image of the surface that would be sufficient to tell the difference between beachfront and ocean. Um, and we could, in fact, do the search for biosignatures there. Have no idea whether this will ever get built, but it's a cool looking telescope. So I thought I'd show you. Um, and of course, farther into the future, we have the 10 meter telescope, we have the giant Magellan telescope, we have the European extremely large um, telescope, all fantastic cutting edge optical um, instrumentation, and then the large uh, synoptic survey telescope, which will take a pick an image of the sky every three days. And so we will have some sensitivity to transients. Laser SETI, Pano SETI, Veritas giving us additional opportunities to find transient events on the sky and optical frequencies. And at the radio frequencies, the FAST, the large telescope in China, and the square kilometer array growing out of the current Meerkat in South Africa. Perhaps we will get to expand the very large array in New Mexico across the Western United States into the next generation VLA. And if we could ever make that funny looking Exo Life Finder telescope I showed you work, then we could build it out to something that was 80 meters across. And this kind of a telescope would be adequate in sensitivity to find and image the heat islands from something like cities on nearby exoplanets. So lots of ideas for how to do things better in the future. And as these new telescopes get built, we in SETI need to figure out how to use them commensally. Um, so farther in the future is that square kilometer array that I mentioned. And it's important because it will have enough compute power that instead of just making three beams in the field of view that you can look at simultaneously, we can maybe uh, calculate as many as 250 beams. And its size, its sensitivity is significantly improving on what we can do now so that we could begin to see things that represent our technology to distances that are um, significantly large fraction of the the galaxy. So when this when and if this ever gets built, we will certainly be using this as a commensal instrument for SETI. And my last slide simply refers to the fact that um, since the beginning of SETI observations at the SETI Institute, 
whenever we are observing at a site, we fly this flag of earth, right? It was uh, designed by a farmer from Iowa, James Cadell, and he wanted the astronauts when they went to the moon, the Apollo astronauts, to fly this flag representing the sun, the earth, and the moon. And all of us, uh, instead of uh, flying the flag of the United States, he didn't win, but we've adopted it for SETI because it represents us all. And uh, we still plan for success in SETI. Wherever we're observing, right, there's always champagne on ice. And I'm going to wrap up really quickly now. Uh, interference is becoming a problem where more and more of the radio spectrum is being blocked. We have to take this into account. We're hoping that machine learning can help us deal with this growing problem for not only SETI, but all of radio astronomy. And so the technologies for the search from our first search in 1992 until the current have changed from having to build our own chips, our own custom chips early on because there was nothing that could do Fourier transforms fast enough back then to today using these fantastic GPU processors um, so that we can process much more bandwidth uh, much more quickly. And over the, all of the years that we've been searching, when SETI turned 50, I did an analysis that I said of the nine parameters that we need to search through to find signals, um, how much have we searched? And I, I calculated the total volume that we might have to uh, look through. And I said, let's let that volume be represented by the volume of the Earth's oceans. And then how much of it have we searched? Well, at 50, we'd searched a glass of water. At 60, it's more like a small uh, pool, right? So it's growing and growing rapidly. And it isn't just Moore's law, right? That's a big part of the reason that we can do so much more. But there's also been dedicated telescopes and more telescopes and more time on the sky via the commensal observing we've been doing. And we've been able to improve our algorithms with machine learning. So the last thing about life beyond Earth is we may, in fact, end up import exporting it. We're talking about going to the moon, to Mars, to the asteroids, breakthrough starshot, <clears throat> and the 100-year starshot starship study are talking about interstellar missions. So I think that the worst thing about being old the way I am is that I will not see the um, results of all of this spectacular work that's coming up in this century. But I think it's important to keep SETI in mind and to talk to people such as yourselves about this project because I think it has the effect when I get you to think beyond your daily routines and consider larger perspectives of space and time and your connection to it, it has the effect of holding up a mirror to everybody on the planet and saying, you see, in that mirror, when compared to something else that may have arisen on a planet orbiting a distant star, although we think of ourselves as being different, we are in fact all the same. We are all earthlings. And I think this cosmic perspective, seeing ourselves in a bigger sense of space and time is really important because we have all of these challenges that are facing us on this planet. And those challenges have to be solved globally. We have to learn how to cooperate in order to get to the answers. And um, so I think this cosmic perspective is really important for our long-term future. And um, Caleb Scharf, who's the chairman of the astrobiology department at Columbia University, agrees. And he tells us that on a finite world, a cosmic perspective isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. So you have a homework assignment, right? When you finish with this meeting and you get back to all your digital devices and they all have profiles of who you are, Go into those profiles and edit them so that the first thing that you say about yourself 
is that you're an earthling and then try and act like it. Thank you. So thank you so much for your lecture. Yeah, actually, I can say it's a kind of poetry classroom for us. <laughs> and so we can make a, and pick some questions for you, Professor. Yes. Maybe two or three questions for you. Right. Okay, you said you have a question for Professor Giuseppe. Yes, yes. Now, the first question I have here is from Franciele. She's asking, how far do you think we are from discovering life outside Earth? Um, well, we're farther than we've been, but I don't think I can answer that question until we succeed. Um, this question, this, this search may have to be multi-generational. I mean, it may be my granddaughter that succeeds eventually. Uh, it's an important question and it's worth putting in the time and energy and effort to make a significant systematic search. So I actually can't answer that question yet. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, the other question we have here is from Carolita. She's asking if, uh, if could other civilizations' technology be so different from ours that we wouldn't be able to identify it? That's actually a possibility. I mean, we think we understand the laws of physics, but I'm sure there's more that we have to learn. Um, it, you know, it may be that we should be looking for zeta rays. I don't know what a zeta ray is, but maybe an advanced technology uses them. But the thing about that is, until we invent them, we can't look for them. So we're stuck with our understanding and the tools that we have in the 21st century um, to try and do this job, which is why I tried to, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time talking about deliberate signals and things that were almost natural and obviously engineered. Um, we just have to, to look at the sky in every way that we can and be open-minded about anomalies to see whether or not they might indicate um, someone else's technology. Okay. The next question we have is from Eliane. She's asking, uh, in your view, is humanity closer to becoming an interplanetary civilization or to extinction? Ah, well, uh, in, my, in my view, there really is no planet B. I mean, I think that we have to put in the effort to solve all of the challenges that we face here on this planet, to figure out how we can have a long future here on Earth. Because if we can't solve those challenges, if we can't get it right here, it doesn't make any sense to go to someplace else because we'll just take the same problems with us and trash that place as well. So I am optimistic that if we learn to cooperate globally and we really focus on it, that we can come up with solutions to global warming, to food and water insecurity, um, all of the things that, that we're facing here. So I'm an optimist. I wouldn't be working on SETI if I weren't. Um, so I'm hopeful that we will get our act together and figure out how to have a long future. And Steven Pinker, who's at Harvard, um, has written a number of books in which he says, he points out that today in the 21st century, we are kinder and gentler as humans than we have ever been in the past. And that is because at some point, cultural evolution began to kick in as well as biological evolution. And that, that he believes that that trend will continue and we will figure out how to get along and how to help one another. Okay, do you still have time for one more, one more question? Um, one more. And then I have okay. to jump up for another meeting. So uh, the last one is from Lennon. 
uh, he's asking what are your thoughts on the possibility of existence of life in Europa? Oh, Europa and Enceladus to me are both extremely interesting. What is in those oceans underneath the ice? Um, and so there is uh, a Europa Clipper mission, an Enceladus exploration mission. Um, I'm going to be really interested to see if there are any hints of bio <coughs> biomolecules in those plumes. Okay. Okay. So, Jutarta, thank you so much for your participation, for your lecture. It was very awesome to listen every information that you talk in, in this, uh, this congress and everyone like uh, your presentation here ricardo talking about your presentation and tatiani also talking awesome lecture professor jill tarter and a lot of people say thank you for you whoa an amazing lecture <laughs> So thank you so much, thank Professor. <laughs> thank you. Have a very good day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, Professor. Ok. Encerramos por aqui, pessoal. Então, essa foi a nossa é, palestrante de Utarte falando sobre uma perspectiva cósmica da vida nessa busca por vida inteligente fora da Terra. Para quem quiser continuar com esse papo falando sobre vida inteligente fora da Terra, a gente vai ter agora uma mesa redonda com a visão de um neurocientista, um filósofo e um astrofísico debatendo questões de como seria essa questão de vida inteligente fora da Terra. Então, já convido todos a virem participar conosco, agradecendo novamente a Glaucia e para quem quiser falar inglês tão bem quanto a professora Glaucia, better than me, of, of course. <risos> a professora Glaucia tem aqui os seus contatos, deixa eu colocar aqui, para quem quiser contactá-la, então entre em contato através desse e-mail, né, em inglês com a Glaucia, arroba gmail.com, e ela vai passar para vocês todas as informações sobre como, é, quais são os horários, viabilidade de preços, turma individual, turma, em grupo, todas as informações que pode se coletar com você, né, Glaucia? Isso mesmo, Bruno. Obrigada, viu? Nada, eu que te agradeço mais uma vez e espero sempre poder contar contigo vindo aqui participar com a gente das palestras internacionais. Claro, claro. Certo, é... precisar. Quer fazer algumas considerações finais antes da gente passar para outra... Outra palestra, Galvão? Ah, não, acho que não. Para o pessoal. Não. Fran, fazer suas considerações finais antes da gente finalizar aqui? Não, só agradecer pela oportunidade. O congresso está sendo maravilhoso. E bora para a próxima. Beleza, então, bora para o próximo. O pessoal já deixar aqui no chat para vocês. Então, vai estar tá um astrofísico, um filósofo e um neurocientista cada um com as suas visões falando sobre vida inteligente fora da Terra. Então, pessoal, até mais. Nos vemos daqui a pouquinho, às 15 para as 8, na próxima sala. Tchau, tchau. Bye, bye. Tchau, gente.